Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to North York General Foundation's House Calls, a conversation with our community. My name is Phil Shin, and I'm the Medical Director of Critical Care at North York General and the Governor on the North York General Foundation Board. I'm also a proud member of the North York community, so I'm especially excited to be able to host and moderate the sixth edition of House Calls. It's going to be a roundtable discussion and a Q&A with our North York general physician experts. For the next hour, we'll be engaging in a conversation about the pandemic and answering your questions. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that any advice offered this evening is not meant to replace that of your physician. If, you're not, if you are experiencing any COVID-19 symptoms or are concerned, please consult your family doctor. I'd like to encourage you to submit your questions for the panel through the Q&A function on Zoom. We'll take some of these questions and also know that some of you have submitted them in advance. We've had many questions submitted already and we'll try to get to as many as we can uh, and hopefully we'll address uh, the important questions. So without further ado, I now have the privilege of introducing our panel. Dr. Kevin Katz. Dr. Katz is the Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control at Northwest General. He's, the he's a medical microbiologist, infectious diseases specialist, and he's spearheaded the COVID-19 response at the hospital from day one. He's also a good friend, and I can personally vouch that he has provided me with invaluable advice over the last two years related to COVID. Uh, those who tuned into our last house calls will know that Dr. Katz is a wealth of information on all things COVID, and we look forward to his insights. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks very much. Glad to be here. Dr. Latino. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Joey Latino, staff pediatrician in pediatrics and genetics. Uh, Dr. Latino has the important role of providing care to North York General Hospital's youngest patients. He'll, so he'll provide a perspective uh, on the impact of COVID-19 on children and what we can expect now that schools have resumed in-person learning. Welcome, Joey. Joey, can I get you off mute? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Shin. I'm uh, happy to be here. Um, finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Danielle Manis, Deputy Chief of Family Medicine, and more importantly, my classmate from the U of T Medical School class of 2001. Uh, Dr. Manis has been actively involved in the COVID-19 vaccination effort in North York, and she'll provide a view into the continued vaccine and booster rollout. So it's great to see you, Danny, and, and great to have you with us. Thanks, it's great to be here. Uh, so to kick things off this evening, Dr. Katz will provide an overview of the current 19 situation locally, uh, both at North York, as well as more broadly. Kevin? Sure, thanks very much, Dr. Shin. So uh, clearly there's still quite widespread uh, community-based activity and transmission of COVID-19, but uh, I'd like to say that there's reason for optimism right now. All of the numbers are turning in the right direction. A number of indicators that we monitor to, uh, to indicate that include the number of cases, which are a bit harder to track since they changed the testing criteria in the province. The percent of tests that are positive, the positivity rate, that's been coming down. In our own lab, uh, the peak was around 48%, and it's uh, just recently uh, hit around 15 to 16% of all tests are positive, so very dramatic reductions. Uh, the number of new outbreaks in hospitals and long-term care, they're still very widespread, but the number of new ones um, have dramatically reduced, and there are quite few that are being declared on a daily basis. And, uh, and the number of patients in intensive care units have crested, has crested over the past uh, several days, and we appear to be on the backside starting to come down slowly. So I think for all of those reasons, there's uh, reason for optimism. And in addition, I think if we just look at what's been happening within the cases and within the outbreaks, uh, just looking at long-term care as an example, some of those early waves, there were uh, unfortunately devastating number of deaths in, uh, in many of those facilities. And during this wave, we haven't heard very much about it, but almost 50% of long-term care homes have been an outbreak recently, but the number of deaths has been dramatically lower um, with very few deaths. And that's all related to the success of the vaccine. So although you can have cases, 
those cases are much, much less severe. So all of those things are very positive and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing all your questions and having a, a great conversation. Kevin, would you mind just giving a little bit of an update at the, at the hospital specifically? Sure. So at the hospital, the, the numbers are still quite high. They, they are slowly coming down. Um, most recent look that I saw, we had about 90 inpatients and within the intensive care unit, almost half of the patients are uh, related to COVID. Uh, that doesn't necessarily give an indication of what's happening in the North York community because the whole healthcare system functions as a whole. And there's quite a large number of transfers that are happening from different jurisdictions. And COVID is a little bit patchy in the way that it uh, travels within jurisdictions. And so recently the West part of the city has been hit a little bit harder than our part of the city. And uh, quite a significant proportion of the patients that are admitted to our intensive care unit have been uh, um, transferred in from other uh, hospitals that are more on the west end of, uh, of the city. But again, all of those numbers are, have crested uh, at the peak, and I think they're slowly, um, uh, the numbers are, are falling. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Joey, can you add to that and share how this latest Omicron spike is impacting children? and um, what to expect now that schools have resumed. Yeah, for sure. So with the significant surge in Omicron in our community over the last few weeks, we've uh, seen a very notable spike in pediatric cases of COVID. And uh, along with this, there's been an increase in pediatric admissions because of COVID, not just at NYGH, but across the GTA. And uh, many of these are babies and infants that are still not eligible to be vaccinated. Uh, and their presentations are varied. On the milder end of things, we've seen many kids presenting with fever, upper respiratory tract symptoms, cough, mild GI symptoms, which is not unlike other viruses. Uh, but on the more severe end of things, we've also had infants presenting with significant diarrhea and vomiting, uh, leading to dehydration, need for IV fluids and frequent blood work. Um, and other respiratory illnesses like croup, pneumonia, bronchiolitis requiring supplemental oxygen. Um, and that's just one of the challenges with this virus. virus. It's mild in many, uh, behaving like other common viruses, but can be quite unpredictable and make some kids very sick. Um, with regards to the in-person schooling resuming, it's, uh, it certainly wouldn't surprise me if we saw a further spike in pediatric cases, uh, especially with community spread still being so high. Uh, but this is why it's so important that we have that layered approach to protecting our kids. It starts with vaccinating them. That's without a doubt the single best thing you can do to protect um, our kids from serious COVID relate, related illness. And then going from there, adding the additional layers like the high quality masks, ventilation, et cetera. Great, thanks, Joey. Danny, I know that you've been involved in the vaccine initiative in North York. Uh, over 81% of people age five and up in Ontario are now fully vaccinated in terms of two doses. What's next with vaccines and boosters? So there's a lot going on with vaccination uh, through our local Ontario health team. Uh, mostly spearheaded by my colleagues, Maria Maraca and Rebecca Stoller. Um, so we're continuing to roll out those third doses. There's still about probably 40% of adults that have not had that third dose. Those are available uh, mostly at our mass vaccination site at Seneca College and our vaccine clinic within the hospital itself. Um, but there's now been a big focus uh, to go back into the community and do outreach. So we've been vaccinating in a lot of congregate living settings. Uh, I was in long-term care the other day. We hit um, shelters, um, you know, all kinds of group homes. Um, and actually the homebound vaccination program has also restarted. So family docs who have say an elderly homebound patient can refer to that program and one of our docs will go out and vaccinate. So really trying to get all those vulnerable sectors, even fourth doses now um, in long-term care. Um, Joey's quite right about the kids and vaccinations So that five to 11 year old age group. Um, the uptake has been okay. We're still probably only at about 50% of that age group that's had even one dose. So that's been a big focus. Um, lots of pediatric friendly, family friendly clinics. Um, and recently, actually, the Ontario Health Team started a program where they've actually assigned a physician ambassador to many of the neighborhood schools. Joey's nodding. So some are pediatricians, some are family docs. And, and basically, the role is to answer questions by email, show up to the school in person, show up to vaccination clinics with a big t-shirt that says, ask me questions, really try to encourage vaccination of that age group because it's really very, very important. So all that work is ongoing alongside everything else. Thanks, Jenny. Kevin, I know that you and I have talked about the importance of third doses and how the term booster may be a misnomer. Do you wanna uh, add anything to that in, in terms of the importance 
of receiving a third dose? Yes. So I think if you look at all of the strains of COVID-19 up until Omicron, predating Omicron, so alpha, beta, delta strains, it was pretty clear that two doses of vaccine were highly protective against symptomatic infection, even mild symptomatic infection. Um, sort of up to 95%, Delta was a little bit lower, maybe in the high 80s or 90% protection, protection against being lab test positive at all, which means that you uh, can transmit to others potentially. So very, very highly efficacious. For Omicron, the numbers have plummeted quite significantly in terms of how protected uh, individuals are from getting infected. And I think it's important to understand that term. When you're infected, it means that you've acquired the virus, it's replicating in your upper airways, and that you can transmit it on somebody else. So that, that would be through a lab test positive. Many of them will have mild symptoms. Some of them can be asymptomatic. So in terms of protecting against infection altogether, which is important for public health reasons to not transmit it, Omicron, uh, the two doses only protects somewhere in the range of 25 to 30 percent. And if you get a third dose, it brings that up towards uh, 75 percent protection. Um, the, the 20 to 25 percent is optimistic because two doses of AstraZeneca essentially is almost equivalent in terms of protecting against infection to getting no doses. So that's not to say that it doesn't protect against severe infection. It does very successfully protect against severe infection requiring admission to hospital or ICU, but two doses still allows you to get a mild infection and propagate that transmission in the community within your household to others. Um, and so I, I do think it's a misnomer when government and public health talks about fully vaccinated being two doses. Um, there's lots of examples in the vaccination realm, hepatitis B, uh, HPV, where a primary immunization series is three doses. And you know, I think two doses was the primary immunization series for everything up until Omicron. But I think Omicron is showing us that for Omicron, just getting your first series of vaccines like the kids get multiple times, for Omicron, it's actually a three dose uh, primary series. And we should stop calling it a booster. It's three doses to get your basic uh, immunity in place. Thanks for, thanks for that uh, clarification. That's, I think that's really helpful. Um, we'll now move to the Q&A portion of the session. Um, a reminder to the viewers at home that it's not too late to submit a question through the Q&A function um, on Zoom. We'll try to get through as many as possible. And to the panelists, I will at least initially direct uh, the question to one of you, but I'm sure the viewers would appreciate dialogue among the three of you, so please feel free to interject at any point. Our first question I'll, I'll direct to Kevin. Um, relates to masks. There's a lot of discussion presently about masking with Omicron. Can you clarify the current mask guidelines? Should we be wearing N95s instead of cloth masks? Uh, a couple of parts to this question. Should they be worn in certain settings? And how long should we be wearing a mask before replacing or cleaning it? Yeah, so there's a bunch of questions all bundled up in there. And I, I guess I'll start off by saying that the guidance will continue to change as, as we move through and past Omicron. Um, I do think that we should and will start to get back to, to normal, whatever that normal is. I think there'll be a new normal and then we'll eventually get back to what normal was before the pandemic. Um, so that the current guidance around N95s is really to be used by healthcare providers when they're caring for confirmed or suspect cases of uh, individuals with COVID-19 or uh, when they're working in an outbreak setting. So that's where um, the N95 mask is recommended. And in addition, um, when physicians or, or uh, healthcare practitioners are doing invasive procedures, even if they're not suspected to have COVID-19, um, many will wear an N95 mask if they're doing bronchoscopies or intubations and things like that, invasive procedures into the respiratory tract. Um, I know that public health officials have muddied the water in terms of how they talk about it and saying, oh, an N95 would be better for, for filtering and, and everybody to wear. Um, I, I take a very pragmatic and practical approach to masks. I think it's clear that a cloth mask without a filter compared to a medical mask, a medical mask is, is superior to the cloth mask. I think that is clear. Um, but whether you need to go from a medical mask, which is a multi-layer mask, 
uh, up to an N95 is a lot less clear. Um, I think there, there actually isn't, there's a lot of people that are screaming and shouting very loudly, but there's not a lot of, of evidence one way or the other. There's actually a big clinical trial that's looking at medical masks versus N95s. Omicron has stirred the pot a bit because it transmits much more easily. So people are, are more concerned about maybe it hanging around in the, in the air. From a practical perspective, from people who are working, living in the community, I think choosing a mask, and I, I think going to a medical mask makes sense, but a mask that actually fits their face well, um, doesn't have big gaps on the side, and that is comfortable is probably the most important because taking individuals who aren't used to wearing an N95 and telling them to go walk around in it for hours and hours and hours, if you try that, it's actually quite uncomfortable. And you end up fidgeting and touching your face a lot and bringing your hands up to your face, especially if they're not clean before you bring them up to your face, touching your mask contaminates them again, not cleaning them. It ends up being a risk. So if you, if you actually are wearing a tight fitting mask that's harder to pull air through and you're constantly fidgeting, um, I believe that 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 needs to be factored in because um, you'll end up self-contaminating and the risk may actually potentially be higher. I don't, we don't have, have the evidence. So choose a mask that's comfortable and fits you well. And I think that's probably the, the best, uh, the best mask that you can choose. Thanks, Kevin, for trying to simplify what uh, ends up being an overwhelming amount of information. I know that it's overwhelming for me, so I can imagine people at home are, are wondering the same thing. Um, Danny, we talked a little bit already about uh, the third dose or booster protecting us from Omicron. Do we have any hope that the current vaccine can protect us against any new variants that emerge? Ooh, need a crystal ball, I think, to answer that question. Uh, and maybe Kevin's better equipped to answer it. I think the reality is that we're going to see new variants in the future, um, but that there will be enough similarity with the upcoming variants that there will be some protection, some mitigation. So, so similar to you know influenza, if you're if you're vaccinated and sometimes the strain that's in the flu vaccine isn't exactly the strain that you end up catching. Uh, you end up getting a less severe course of illness and you're still less likely to be hospitalized or die. So that, that's my hope. Um, but again, it's a bit of a crystal ball question because who knows what the next variant is going to look like. Um, I don't know, Kevin, if you, you probably have more insight into this than me. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would, I agree with you. I think I would frame, just so people understand what a pandemic is and why it happens. The, re the reason that we've had a pandemic is because a non-human coronavirus jumped into humans um, and we all know that if, if we're sick with a cold, we can't give it to our dogs or to our cats. And if our cats have an illness, their cats or dogs, it doesn't jump into us. Viruses are species specific. But in this case, this was a bat coronavirus that jumped into humans. We had no immunity and our bodies didn't know how to interact with it and it didn't know how to interact with us. And so it caused very severe disease. Um, getting vaccinated, getting infected gives you some immunity. So all of a sudden, you once you have your primary immunization series or you've been infected, you've turned this bat coronavirus into a virus your body has seen, and all of a sudden it's a human virus. So it's gonna continue circulating forever. And the severe outcomes that we were seeing in the early waves, we shouldn't see to the same extent, even if it escapes the vaccine. So yes, it will continue to mutate. Yes, the vaccine won't work, it won't work against it. We'll be able to get infected with common cold type symptoms and fevers but it's not, gonna, it's not gonna lead to the large number of deaths that it did in those early waves. That, that, that is not generally the way that it, it happens in pandemics. So just at a high level, you're right, we're, we're gonna have new variants, we're gonna have lots of outbreaks, we're gonna have, but it's all gonna be at the milder end of the spectrum like influenza. Danny, if I could ask a follow-up, I think we've made it clear this evening that three doses is the primary vaccination series. There are other jurisdictions now where maybe the booster should, should apply to a fourth dose. Can you uh, clarify anything about a fourth sure. dose in terms of effectiveness and recommendations and who should get that and does it work? Yeah, so it, it does. So the fourth dose recommendation currently is really for people who are quite immune compromised. So, so anybody who's on medications that significantly suppress their immune system, maybe they've had a, an organ transplant, 
the cancer treatment ongoing. Um, and it also applies to elderly uh, or any resident really of any age living in a retirement home or a long-term care home because it's an extremely high risk setting for transmission. And the rationale is that if your immune system is not fully functioning, you're not going to create or, or mount a good response to the vaccines. You're not going to have as much immunity with three vaccine doses as a person who has a, a properly functioning immune system. So for the, the average sort of reasonably healthy immunocompetent, as we call it, person, right now three doses gives pretty good protection, 75% against infection and, and much higher protection against severe illness and ICU admission. So for now, for the average person, three doses is okay. Um, and if you fall into that category of being very significantly immune compromised, um, then a fourth dose would be indicated. Just to almost bring you up on par with everybody else in terms of your immune response. Great. Thanks, Jenny. Joey, if we could switch over to the, the five to 12 age group. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about how the vaccine rates in that age range has plateaued. Um, what are some of the concerns you're hearing from parents and in return, what advice have you been uh, providing? Um, well, in terms of the like the plateau question, I, I really think it's um, there are multiple factors kind of playing a role. First, I think there's this perception that uh, COVID is always mild in children when in fact it's not the case or, or not a guarantee, but that belief kind of causes us to put down our guards, makes us a little more complacent and has dampened that, that urgency to vaccinate kids for some parents and guardians. Um, another factor is like the sincere concern by families that the vaccine is too novel and we don't know enough about it. Um, you know, like parents care about their kids above everything else and they want to do what's, you know, what they can to keep them safe and keep them healthy. But there's this misconception out there that the COVID vaccine hasn't been studied when in fact it's went through the phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials and already has been given to millions of kids with a, a really terrific safety profile. And, you know, that last factor that is important, you know, to address that probably is playing a role in this plateau, it, it's something that's happened throughout our entire pandemic. So, you know, the vaccine rates are lowest in areas that contain marginalized populations. And um, as I said, it's it's been the theme throughout the pandemic. Most of our vulnerable have been left with us looking at them through the rearview mirrors and overcoming language barriers, connecting with communities that uh, through medical professionals that they can trust and relate to is a really important part here. Thanks, Joey. Um, Kevin, if I can move to you, I know that we just talked about variants I'm sure people at home are reading about subvariants and BA2 subvariant of Omicron. Um, is it, you know, maybe one question I'd ask beyond that is what's going to be our, our new normal, in your opinion? Um, I mean, it's a bit of a crystal ball, but I think, I think that this is the way it's going to play out. Hopefully, we continue to get vaccination rates up, and those that aren't vaccinated, pretty much 100% of them will eventually get infected. It's just a matter of time. And, uh, and once that happens, it probably will regress to becoming a seasonal virus where uh, it, it's more of a problem in the winter season, like all of the other respiratory viruses, common cold, influenza, paraflu, croup, all those things. Um, I, I think that the next several years will be uh, somewhat heavier than normal years for a number of reasons. All of the other viruses from the masking and the distancing haven't really been circulating. So the immunity that we had to all the usual viruses has waned. So I suspect they'll do a catch up once we start to go back to normal life. And then COVID itself, um, the, the world has been very unevenly vaccinated so that there's a, a ton of virus circulating in many parts of the world, uh, very, very high rates. And it, essentially the way I characterize it is um, there's there's the equivalent of an entire influenza season happening every single day, which means that the virus is replicating. And when it replicates, it makes mistakes and creates the mistakes essentially are mutations that lead to, to variants. So I think for the next five years, just keeping up with changing the vaccine so that we keep the mild infections away may be a bit unrealistic. I suspect that there'll be lots of mild infections, not, not a lot of the severe end of, of, uh, of infection, and it probably will uh, be focused mostly through uh, the winter season is, is my guess, best guess. Um, first live question, um, this I'll direct uh, to, to Kevin. Um, you've already talked about masks as an adjunct focus really on uh, full vaccination. Um, here's maybe another question about an adjunct. 
Um, is air filtration still considered important in preventing the spread of COVID? If so, are HEPA filters recommended for homes? So for, are they recommended in homes? I would say no. Um, essentially homes is where you live. If, if individuals in the household are positive, there's a very, very high attack rate within the home. HEPA filters, non-HEPA filters, just, you know, just the way that homes work with everybody touching the same surfaces, working in the same kitchens, using the same washrooms, et cetera. I think within households, there's an attack rate of about 40 or 50% to household members. So um, I don't think it's worth looking at HEPA filters. Uh, in that setting. Maybe I'll give the big picture again around masks and, and HEPA filters just in, in general, because I, I think when the media talks about it and even public health officials, the, the message really isn't getting across. Um, fundamentally, we're not going to be wearing masks for the rest of our lives. We're not going to be uh, filtering air everywhere we go. It's just not feasible. We have to get back to normal. The way you get back to normal is with immunity. And the two ways you become immune is by either getting your vaccinations, all your doses that you need, or getting infected. And so I, I think that masking and, and uh, HEPA filters and distancing, all of these things are really to just get us through these periods of very, very high activity during the waves when the, when the risk of acquiring it is very high. Um, there will be a chronic grumble in the background of transmission, low, low rates of transmission between waves. Um, so hopefully once the waves settle, uh, everyone's vaccinated or infected, we won't have these big, big surges. Um, you know, we're, we're, we shouldn't be, we won't be, walking around in, this, in masks and, and uh, everyone installing gazillions of dollars of, of HEPA filters everywhere. Um, you know, there, there will probably be a culture change. There's always been parts of the world that, that were more, um, had more of an affinity to, to mask wearing, but um, I, I would bet in, that in two years, it will look very similar to, um, I, I'm saying two years conservatively, I think it should be a lot sooner than that, but realistically, we're gonna get fully back to the way that we were. Danny, following along the theme perhaps of what we should or may or may not need in the home, sure. uh, what medicine or supplies would you recommend someone should have at home in case they end up with COVID? And when should they head to the emergency department? Those are good questions. And, um, you know, there'd be, with the very high rate of infections in the community right now, um, we family doctors have been fielding a lot of phone calls and, and uh, conversations about this with our patients. So for most people who are healthy and their symptoms are relatively mild, especially if they're vaccinated, uh, they can safely stay home and just monitor their symptoms. So what you really need is some Tylenol or Advil to treat your fever, headaches and aches and pains and some fluids to drink. Um, a really handy thing to have is, a, is an oxygen saturation monitor. So one of those little devices that goes on your finger that measures the percentage of oxygen in your blood. Um, and that's especially important if you have some underlying uh, lung disease like asthma or COPD or you're older or you're experiencing a little bit of shortness of breath. Um, I guess I should add if you have asthma or COPD, you should have your puffers and be taking them as prescribed. Um, in terms of, of when to go to the eMERGE, I mean, it, there's, a, there's a few resources out there to help you. Obviously, if you have very significant shortness of breath, chest pain, you know, you're fainting, you can't walk, you know, any really, you know, signs of dehydration, obviously you should be calling an ambulance and going. Um, your family doctor is a great resource. So again, uh, call your family doctor, speak to them or a nurse just to go through your symptoms and make sure you're safe. Um, there is a program uh, through the Ontario College of Family Docs uh, called COVID at Home that allowed family doctors to get oxygen saturation monitors for free to distribute to our patients. So your family doctor might have one for you. It's worth a phone call to say, hey, I'm home, I've got COVID, or I think I have COVID, I've got a little bit of shortness of breath, and, and I'm, you know, how can I get one of those monitors? You might be able to get it that way. Um, and the other thing I should share, and I think Lizzie has um, a link to send out, there's a local program, I think organized by Dr. Ben Bell from our internal medicine group, um, the COVID remote monitoring program. So this is for anybody who's at home with no nurse suspected COVID who might need a little bit of support. Um, and they can actually, you can refer yourself to that program. So your doctor can refer you, but you can also refer yourself. Um, so basically you connect with a nurse in the community uh, through an app, they ask you to download and share some data, including your oxygen levels and your symptoms, and they check in frequently. 
and can um, consult an internal medicine doctor at North York General for support or admission if needed. So that's a great program. Again, if you're maybe a little older, a little sicker, you have some health problems and you think you don't think you're sick enough for the hospital, really great option. And I think it's going in the chat there. Um, and then the last thing I would add is if you're, if you're over 70 and, and you have some underlying health issues, let's say you have asthma, diabetes, kidney disease, uh, there's a list out there, you might be eligible for a test and treatment in the community. So there, there is some approval for some inhaled and oral medications for people who aren't that sick, but are high risk of getting sicker. So if you think you might fall into that category, you can call your doctor to speak about it. Don't wait too long because you usually want that treatment within the first week of symptoms. The other option is our local um, COVID assessment center, which is also called the Cough, Cold and COVID uh, Center, where I work. Uh, that's in our community. It's at the Branson site at Bathurst and Finch. Um, you can book an appointment. You may or may not be eligible for a PCR test. And I know that when my last couple of ships there, a lot of people are being turned, told at the door that they don't meet the new government criteria for testing. But again, if you're 70 and you have some underlying comorbidities, and, and you would be considered for treatment, sometimes that's a reason to get a test. So it's not a bad thing if you think you're eligible, book an appointment. Some patients at the door there who know they aren't gonna get tested still ask to come see the doctor and that's also okay. So I'm always happy to see a kid with a fever who doesn't qualify for a PCR swab but might have an ear infection or a healthy 30 year old with an asthma flare up. Um, you know, if they're there and maybe it's hard to access your family doctor in person, I don't want a flood of a thousand people coming there because I'm gonna get in trouble. But um, sometimes that's a really good resource. So you should know about all of these things, um, but always start with a phone call to your family doctor. Good. Jenny, thanks for that uh, great overview. Uh, Joey, can I just ask a follow-up for some viewers who may have uh, young babies at home if they end up becoming infected, um, what advice can you give for, for parents with, with newborns or young infants and what, should they, should, what they should be looking out for? I just want to clarify, Dr. Schoen, are you asking if, uh, like, what to look out for and if the child's getting sick? Like, what are some of the signs that come to hospital? That's right. I think Amy covered a lot of ground with um, yeah. adults and older older folks. How about um, for, for, for young babies? Yeah, it's an excellent question. So um, the two things that are probably going to get kids very sick with COVID are respiratory and the second being dehydration. Um, in terms of the respiratory um, symptoms, you want to look for how fast your baby's breathing, um, if they look like they're putting a lot of effort into their breathing. So that would be things like sucking in under the ribs, maybe a little bit of a suck in under in the throat area, um, or any obviously any blueness to their lips. Those would be all emergencies to, to come back uh, to come to hospital. In terms of hydration, um, it really depends on the kid. But you know, an older kid, I think parents generally know how much their their kid is drinking and. Um, when they're dehydrated or not, but some of the, the signs to look out for are, you know, really not taking in good volumes, um, peas and wet diapers being down, dry, cracked lips, seeming very, very sleepy. Um, this, this virus uh, really affects the upper airways in kids. Um, it can cause a really, really nasty sore throat and can give you fevers. And both those situations not, are not a good mix for, for dehydration. Um, so yeah, those would be my, my kind of uh, go-tos. I don't know if Dr. Dr. Manis has uh, any other symptoms. I, uh, yeah. I, I would totally agree for sure. Yeah. Um, Joey, can I ask you some more questions here about children under the age of five who cannot yet be vaccinated and any advice you can provide to parents regarding one, decisions about seeing family, family and friends and two, whether or not they should send their children to school or daycare in this age range. Yeah, so I'm in the boat, the same boat with my my own family. I have I have a young kid at home who's not eligible to be vaccinated. But really, the answer to this question is a very personal one. It depends on personal and family circumstances. Um, you know, our kids under five are still not eligible to be vaccinated, which is going to be a very important part of their protection. So while we wait for it to be available, we try our best to, to insulate them, try to create that, that shield around them. And I can tell you that all of the measures that have been promoted throughout the pandemic, ensuring that, you know, household members are, are vaccinated with three doses, limiting contacts, masking, you know, cracking open that window if you have a guest, are things that we can do to keep our, our youngest safe. And, and I practice what I'm preaching, like this is what we do in, in our own home. And, um, you know, just a, an extra point here, if you're pregnant, 
getting that getting that vaccine, not only does it protect the mother, but those antibodies that are generated during the pregnancy are going to be transferred to the baby by the placenta. And this will give them several months of protection after they are born in a time where they can't get vaccinated. You know, in that last part of the question about, you know, sending your kids to, to daycare or to school, again, it really depends on, on personal circumstances. I can't directly answer this because it's so circumstantial. Some people aren't afforded the luxury. If they don't work because they're keeping their kids at home, then they can't make ends meet. But finances aren't even the only factor here. Parent burnout and mental health all play a role. But what I would say is all you can do is try your best to limit those exposures that are in your control, take risks where you need to and limit them where you don't have to. Great answers. Um, I'm gonna throw one more at you related to children. So what do we know about the long-term effects of COVID in children? Yeah, so COVID-19 can cause issues in children beyond just the um, acute infection. I think probably the most well-known or two of the most well-known that people are aware of currently are this inflammatory condition that can happen several weeks after recovering from a COVID infection. And this affects kids and teens. It, it actually affects kids and teens that are in that vaccination eligible group. So, um, and there is evidence now that the vaccine helps to prevent this condition. So that's one. Um, there's emerging data that COVID-19 may increase the risk of type one diabetes in children, which is a lifelong disease. And then there's long COVID, like a condition that we still don't fully understand, but can be very debilitating, not only in adults, but teens and children. And this is just what we know so far. We're constantly learning more and more about uh, COVID and other unknown long-term effects with the virus may still emerge, so. Um, Kevin, I'm gonna move back to you for the next question. Um, Ontario has numerous restrictions in place. In the US and many other countries do not or have less restrictions, how do, our, how do our numbers compare and any other comments you'd like to make about the, the relative differences? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's very, very challenging to compare one jurisdiction to another for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, I, I think if you just look at testing and the criteria for testing, um, changing them a little bit dramatically impacts on the numbers that you would see in terms of cases. So I think we peaked somewhere at 15 or 20,000 cases in a day. There are other countries who continued testing and have hit 100,000, 200,000 for similar, similar size populations as Ontario. Um, they're just, they just were able to keep up with testing to actually see what the, what the headline number is. Um, and then there's, there's the actual patient demographics, um, you know, whether, whether the culture um, is one that uh, embraces long-term care or not. Some cultures will keep uh, elderly home in much higher numbers. So I think it's very, very hard to compare um, to compare numbers overall. I think if you look at death rates per 100,000 population, I think there's clearly some jurisdictions that have fared much worse than others. If you look at the United States, their death rate um, as a percentage of the population or, or uh, rate among the population per 100,000 uh, is among the worst. And then you have other jurisdictions that have really clamped down for very long periods of time and locked down and have much, much lower uh, rates. Um, but you can have you know, European countries that are one side by side that have very different uh, rates. And does that relate to demographic differences? Um, you know, what the population pyramid looks like? Um, it's it's very very challenging to do a direct uh, comparison. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Kevin, we know that Omicron is um, more transmissible than previous variants. Is there any evidence that Omicron transmission can occur from surface contamination? Given that information right now circulating suggests that infection is primarily caused by airborne-based transmission. Yeah, so in terms of the airborne, I would say it's not clear. I don't, and people are saying it's airborne. I actually don't know that there's clear, clear studies. I think some of the, um, some of the data around the communicability factor, which, you know, when you look at one case transmits to how many other cases, um, Omicron is up in a range that is, is similar to other viruses like chickenpox, um, not quite as high as measles, but close. And those are airborne viruses. So that's, that's uh, inferring, but the data to prove it is not really there. And, and that wasn't the case with previous strains of COVID-19. And typically what a virus doesn't change the way it transmits when you have a new strain, it stays the same. 
Um, so oh, I'm blanking on it. Could you bring me back to your question, Phil? <laughs> uh, I think we were just asking about surface contamination. Oh, yes, versus... yes, yes, yes. Sorry. So, so, I mean, there was a very interesting study published in the British Medical Journal, which was, um, which is a very respected journal and actually looked at all of the big public health measures. They combined, it wasn't a study all by itself, it was a study of all of the studies that were published. And it's interesting when they looked at wearing masks, just, just masks, not which mask, just wearing a mask, yes, no, hand hygiene uh, interventions, yes, no, um, distancing. Um, it was interesting when they looked at that, hand hygiene actually had an impact statistically, had quite a big impact. Wearing a mask, yes, no, actually was not statistically important in that study. So to me, that actually would suggest that surfaces may actually play somewhat of a role. Um, there was early studies back in, in 2020 that you know, looked at how many hours or days it could survive on certain surfaces and stainless steel, it would survive for longer than organics, materials like wood or, or cardboard and things like that. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't think that the talk that's saying, oh, it's all air, wear an N95 and you'll be good. I don't think that that's substantiated. I think if you actually, once you see a speaker on TV who's saying that, go and Google whether they have a connection to an N95 company or whether they're actually an aerosol researcher for the past 15 years and all their grants relate to that. I would take it with a healthy dose of uh, skepticism. So I, I think sanitizing your hands, cleaning surfaces, um, we do those things in outbreaks and, and that's what helps bring outbreaks under control combined with masking and distancing and everything. Would it be fair to say no need to wipe down our groceries, but wash your hands and, and really- Yeah, so, so I, I mean, in terms of doing what, uh, doing what I say, similar to what Joey was saying, I go to the grocery store, I wear a regular mask and, uh, and I wash my hands before I touch my face to take my mask off and I unpack my groceries without my mask. And then once I'm done, I wash my hands before I move on to do other things. Um, having clean hands whenever you're touching your face, your face is, is really, uh, really important. And the other, the other piece which no one talks about, which is actually the biggest risk, everyone's always afraid of other and strangers and grocery stores and pay, you know, healthcare workers are afraid of patients or teachers are afraid of the students. The biggest risk of transmission is from your friends and your colleagues that you trust and are close with because you let your guard down and you sit close to them and you eat and you drink uh, during your breaks. That's when actually the vast majority of transmissions are actually happening. It's, it's with people that you know and trust because your guard is down and you're, you're not actually cleaning your hands and being careful about distancing and things like that. Um, so I think that's that's an important piece that people don't talk about. Everyone loves talking about masking and 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 uh, HEPA filters, but it's the, it's it's the other things that will help more. Great, thanks, thanks, Kevin. Danny, I know that we've tried to reinforce this evening the importance of a three dose series. Yeah. Um, the fact is, though, that that there are going to be people who have become infected after their second dose of vaccine, and I think a common question the question here is how long after testing positive for COVID should you wait to get your third dose? It's a really good question. It came up a lot in December because we saw tons of community transmission and most adults at that point had only had two doses. Um, so it's interesting. So it, you know, kind of goes to the question of how long after natural infection do you have immunity? Do you have natural antibodies and how long can you rely on those for? And that question is not 100% clear. Um, different studies say different things. It may be as, as short as eight weeks, maybe even four weeks, could be as long as six months. Time will tell. So it's not entirely clear, but I think the, the take home message is if you've had a recent infection, you have some protection for a period of time. It is not a rush to go get your, your booster. Um, and probably you should try to wait at least four weeks um, simply to make sure that all the symptoms of COVID are out of your system. And if you experience some side effects from the vaccine, it will be very clear that those are vaccine side effects and not residual COVID side effects or some exacerbation of your COVID. So I'd say wait a minimum of four weeks. You could wait even as long as eight or 12 weeks if, if you wanted to. Um, I, I think that's the, where we're at now. Any, any thoughts otherwise, Joey or Kevin? Oh, I would agree with you. I, I would just maybe uh, say something explicit that you were that you were implying is that having a natural infection does not provide the long-lasting immunity 
that vaccination does. So getting two doses and then infection is not the same as three doses. And so even if you've had a natural infection, you should get your full immunization series because it leads to longer lasting immunity. So yeah. I, I know you, you implied that. I just wanted to no, say it. Better to, better to just say it outright, um, for sure. And I think my recollection at the beginning of uh, Omicron was the interesting data that came out of South Africa was what a huge proportion of the population had had a Delta infection. And then within a month or two had, a, or maybe a couple of months had Omicron. Um, so that, that just proves Kevin's point. You need vaccination to get long-term immunity. Perhaps we can move to address some, a, a question uh, perhaps more relevant to the 10% of eligible people who have not received uh, even a first dose. And if I could direct this to either Danny or Joey, um, there are people who believe that vaccines cause autism or fertility problems. What would you say to patients or parents with these concerns? So the autism um, concern probably stems from um, the MMR um, stuff that was going on many, many, many years ago, which has been uh, disproven. It, the MMR vaccine does not cause autism. The COVID vaccine has had no association with autism. Um, and the fertility is, you know, and, and perhaps uh, Danielle and, and Kevin can add to this, but, you know, part of that concern with fertility came from the fact that um, the vaccine contains information to create a spike protein. And uh, during pregnancy and when the placenta implant, implants, it uses a spike protein, but it, it's a completely different spike protein. It's like comparing the eye of a fruit fly to the human eye. Um, so somebody made this leap that um, by creating antibodies against the spike protein to COVID virus that it was gonna impact fertility, which is absolutely false. There is no physiologic basis. There is no clinical evidence that the vaccine um, causes infertility. There is, when you do get the vaccine, it can lead to temporary disruptions or it can temporarily impact your uh, menstrual cycle. COVID does that as well, but it is not permanent. Um, yeah. I, th I think that feeds a lot of the anxiety too, because I definitely had a lot of patients, you know, have a, a missed period and a regular cycle uh, around the time of the vaccine and, and definitely connected it to the vaccine. And, you know, what does this mean? But we've seen that it all resolves uh, very quickly. I want to move to a question about COVID treatment and um, uh, to Kevin, will there be outpatient uh, drug treatment for early, early COVID-19 infection? And now we're moving forward. Uh, I suspect out into the future, there'll be a lot more treatments that, that will be developed and, uh, and approved. For now, uh, you've probably been reading in the media um, a Pfizer drug called Paxlovid um, that has been approved by Health Canada and the FDA. Um, that will be used for people who are at high risk of severe complications early in their uh, infection on the outpatient side, that's the way it's planned to be used. I don't think the, the uh, government has fully determined how it's gonna get rolled out, but um, Ontario has received over 10,000 courses. And so those are just arriving and they'll figure that out over the coming days. Um, people are, are portraying it as a miracle drug uh, because it could reduce the risk of uh, admission to hospital by 90% among those uh, at high risk. What I will say is Paxlovid is actually uh, um, made up of two different drug compounds in it. One is the active drug, and the second one is called ritonavir, and it actually inhibits the liver enzyme that degrades the active drug that's in the compound. Um, you probably know that the liver actually is what cleans the blood of all drugs and metabolizes them out of the system. And so ritonavir blocks that metabolism, so it boosts the level of the active drug so it can have a greater effect. That's good for, for this for this Paxlovid active drug. The problem is it, it also interacts with a whole bunch of other medications because the same liver enzymes degrade all of these other medications. And, uh, and so it will be used in people who have uh, immunodeficiencies, lots of comorbidities, the elderly. Um, and the problem is that all of those groups are on many, many different medications. And so I don't no time will tell how easy it is to prescribe this agent um, and how broadly it would be applicable without interacting with blood thinners and other very important cardiac drugs. Um, and, uh, and 
it may not be able to be used to, in such a widespread way. And it does have side effects, never mind the drug interaction. So I, it's not it's not like taking Tylenol. It's not going to be as easy as that. Um, and so I think we'll have to see um, the experience with uh, with how it's used in real life, not just in clinical trials. You mentioned that Ontario has just received its first shipment of uh, Paxlovid. Uh, can you just, do you have any details about how it will be prescribed? Can a, would you think a family doctor will be able to prescribe it? How will, how will it be um, um, made available um, to the public? Yeah, I, I think we'll need to, to keep our finger on that pulse for the next week. As best as I can tell, currently the plan is to connect it to uh, the community assessment centers that are doing the testing. Um, there will be depots within those assessment centers and hospitals that host those assessment centers that will actually store the drug and dispense the drug. There'll be three of them in the GTA. And uh, it's not really clear whether you need to go to one of those assessment centers to get your test and get the drug dispensed there, or whether you can go to any assessment center um, and then the physician in the assessment center writes the prescription and it, it, they'll dispense it to you um, at, the assess at, at, at any of the other dozen or two dozen or three dozen assessment centers in the city. I think, I, I, I don't think anyone knows that answer. I think they're quickly scurrying to try to figure out how to dispense it. But I think it's important to know that it's available uh, and it will be beneficial, particularly to people at highest risk. And, and the ones I would put in that category are people who haven't received any doses of vaccine would be at high risk. And then people who are immunocompromised, transplant patients, uh, chronic illness, uh, illnesses, and then uh, the elderly over the age of 60 or 65. And the, the, the older that uh, the individual is, the higher uh, the risk. So it sounds like we'll be getting some answers in the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, Danny, vaccine mixing, um, what would you be, what would be your advice to someone who's experiencing hesitancy um, mixing vaccine brands? It's a good question um, because the Pfizer, you know, for whatever reason, a lot of people seem to feel it's superior uh, to the Moderna vaccine. And the truth is it's not really, they're interchangeable. Um, we've had some supply issues, which has led to the sort of prioritization of Pfizer vaccine for younger populations. So for the 12 to 17 year olds and even up to age 30, and then we're trying to give Moderna over age 30. Um, and they've had people show up for their vaccine appointments, find out it's Moderna and say, no, thank you. And I really think that's the wrong choice. Um, it's extremely effective, um, and at a time where the Omicron infectivity rate is just so incredibly high, it does not make sense to wait uh, for a different vaccine brand. So I would say take the vaccine that's offered. Uh, they're both effective. They're both incredibly safe. Uh, and even mixing them, you get excellent uh, response and no increase in, in side effects. Okay. Um, thanks, Jenny. Um, Kevin, we had talked earlier about... Uh, parents with young children, whether they should be visiting friends, what advice would you give to someone who is living with uh, somebody who has autoimmune disease, um, who is fully vaccinated and would like to start seeing some friends and family? Yeah, I, I'm, I am somebody who believes that we do need to start to get back to normal somewhat, but I'm also uh, cautious when I need to be cautious. So I think, um, when we're in a wave and there's a lot of transmission, it's not, not the time to be um, taking risks. And individuals who are at high risk, including those with autoimmune disease, uh, the elderly, those who are not vaccinated, creating a bubble around them so that the virus doesn't get imported into the household is, is actually quite important. And I did say that once it is introduced to the household, transmission rates are 40 to 50% within that household. So um, it will transmit if it's imported. Um, so I think my advice would be, yes, um, socialization uh, is important. Loneliness can kill as well. And, uh, and so I would probably wait until the wave settles down. I don't think it's going to be dramatically longer, hopefully. I don't know with the kids going back to school, it may give us a little bit of a bump. But um, if, if we wake up in three weeks and, and things are dramatically improved, I think that's the time to uh, to start to um, move things back towards normal, to start seeing family, um, and uh, and and those are more calculated risks, as, as uh, Joey had talked about uh, in previous conversations. Great, thanks. Um, I'll move to the last question before we get to closing remarks, and I'll, I'll throw this to to each of you. Reflecting back on the last two years of healthcare in Ontario, what do you think 
have been some of the biggest lessons learned about the pandemic and what would be your hope for the future? Uh, Joey, can I start with you? Yeah, um, I mean, I can tell you from some professional, um, like a professional perspective, the more you learn, the less you feel like you know. And really um, that expert label is, uh, uh, you know, we all have different expertise in different areas and there's some experts that are experts. So um, just being, choosing wisely with, with who you're, um, you're obtaining your information from. And then from a personal perspective, you know, just the importance of, of people and connection and how much that's really mess. Um, it's, uh, it's such an important part of life and uh, can't wait to, to get back to that at a, a normal level. Sorry, Danny? Yeah, I think, you know, along the lines of what Joey said, we've touched upon mental health, um, but not gone really into it. But to me, that's been the overarching theme of this pandemic. Uh, in family medicine, we deal with mental health above everything else, to be honest. But in the pandemic, it has been next level in terms of the severity, the frequency, people who have never had a problem before all of a sudden struggling. So I guess my message is be kind and compassionate to everyone you meet. Um, everybody's struggling no matter who they are. And uh, if they're burnt out, if they're stressed out, um, just show a little bit of compassion because we are all in this together. Thank you, Danny. And Kevin? Yeah, I mean, big takeaways. I think if I, if I want to look at it from a glass half full uh, perspective, I think the miracle of vaccines is, uh, is probably a, a really big one. People ideally would, would want it to be just get your, you get your doses and, and the virus melts away and ceases to exist. I don't think that's realistic. If you look at what vaccines have done and the number of lives it's saved in subsequent uh, waves, it really is very remarkable. Maybe it doesn't feel like it in the waves. Why are we having a wave when we have vaccines? But if you zoom out and look at, at the wave um, and the number of deaths and, and, and that type of thing, I think it, it really is miraculous. If I want to look at it from a glass half empty, I, I think that this pandemic has really highlighted how god awful our system has been in terms of renewing infrastructure of the healthcare system. Uh, long term care homes uh, are old, multi bedded rooms uh, with terrible ventilation. Hospitals don't have enough beds. Uh, Ontario has the lowest number of beds in the developed world per population. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we, we really do need to be investing in the infrastructure of our healthcare system. It does, it does have a humongous impact. And I think that we need to demand that of, uh, of governments. Um, I know they have short term views, but, uh, but these, these projects cost a lot of money. We've spent a lot of deficit spending, but we haven't actually renewed any of the infrastructure that needs to be renewed uh, from my perspective. So I think positives and, and negatives. As we are wrapping up the session, I wanted to give each of you um, a chance to share any final words um, for viewers. Um, I'll, I'll start with you, Daniel. Um, I actually, uh, rather than words, just a resource. I think Lizzie has a link uh, to a fantastic uh, resource for the public that was developed by some of my family medicine colleagues downtown at Unity Health. I hope they don't mind me sharing because it's been shared on social media and is for public consumption um, just to help answer any common questions you might have about COVID at this time. Um, so hopefully Lizzie can put that in the chat and um, just thank you for having me. Kevin or Joey? Yeah, you know, just the same message, the single best thing you can do to protect your kids from COVID and serious related disease is to vaccinate them, gives them protection against in all settings, whether they're at school, or they're at home, or they're at some other place and across all circumstances. Uh, really the the best decision I think you can make for your kiddo and I know there's a lot of, um, or there's some concern out there regarding long term uh, effects. Just, you know, one last pitch for this. If you're going to see a vaccine side effect, it happens in the first six weeks after vaccine administration. It is highly unlikely after that. We're millions of doses in. Many, many months later, the vaccine is safe. Is safe. It has a terrific safety profile. Thanks, Joey and Kevin. Yeah, I mean, I think we've had a whole bunch of messages. If I'm trying to pick ones that are different than others. I, I think this pandemic has, has really demonstrated that we're all in this together. I mean, when we, I say we, there's we at the hospital, there's we in the North York community, at the, at the country level, and even at the global level. Um, you, can't, you can't just take steps to protect yourself. It really is important that we work together. Um, 
you know, if you know somebody who's anxious about being vaccinated or uh, frustrated about something, sometimes just a conversation from a trusted uh, physician or from a trusted friend makes all of the difference. And, uh, and I, I do think that we, we need to remember our place in the world and, and really advocate for vaccines uh, in all of the countries around the world, because um, I, I think somebody had said that you, you can have the best uh, fire alarm system uh, and fire extinguishers in your apartment, but if you live in an 18 story building and, uh, and there's fires all around you and no one else has any of those protections, then, then uh, you're not really protected at all. Um, and so, um, yeah, we're, we're all in this together and I think we need to remember that, be kind to each other and, uh, and help each other out. And I'd like to share a thought as well, which is that the support of the North York community has been so great to the hospital and to the foundation and it's been crucial to upholding the morale of healthcare workers at the hospital and our hospital's COVID-19 response. And the strong support of the foundation has allowed us to have the best equipment and the safest spaces in the hospital to provide care to our patients. And thanks to all of you for that support. And if any of you are, would like to support our ongoing efforts, they can donate by going to the foundation website. We'll put a link on the screen at the end of the session and also share in, in an email to everyone tomorrow. So our evening is coming to a close. Uh, thank you once again to the three of you for sharing your expertise with us tonight. I'd also like to thank those of you who took time to join us this evening and submit questions live and in advance. I found this conversation super informative and I hope you did as well. Uh, it's been a pleasure being your moderator this evening. A couple of reminders in the next few days, you will receive a link to this recording uh, and you will also have a short survey that will help us plan future house calls going forward. And on behalf of North York General and the North York General Foundation, have a great evening.